Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh How are you guys doing and welcome to this new session of the Intellectual Seerah where we're going to be discussing potentially one of the most important things one of the most important events of all of human history Yes it is Fathu Mecca or the conquest of Mecca the time where is it is demarcated in human history where Islam started to proliferate really if you think about it outside of its own geographical borders this is when Mecca was conquered by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the time where we can analyze the behaviors, the psychologies of not just the Prophet himself, but his companions as well. And in fact, by looking at some of the things that have happened in the Fatah of Mecca or the conquest of Mecca, we are also able to see the extent to which Islam is, quote unquote, a religion of violence, a religion of barbarism of backwardsness, of killing the people, innocence and so on. Because we will see the magnanimous nature of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the forgiving nature of this man. Because let me tell you something before we start. I should say this, that many people look at the life of the Prophet and they say, look at him. He's a man that was obsessed with war. A man that was engaged in military warfare all of his life. A man who inspired those people to conquer all these territories and colonize the world and so on and so forth. This is probably the most long-standing moral argument against Islam. In fact, Montgomery Watt himself states that. Interestingly, I was looking at his assessment in his book about the Sirah, and Montgomery Watt doesn't mention anything about the age of Aisha in there at all, zero. From what I remember, he does not mention it. He has a brief mentioning of Zainab bin Tajash. But he supposes that really, he's saying this himself in the 1900s, before the new age, before whatever happened, that the greatest moral argument against Islam is an argument from violence. Because once again, the medieval Christians, for example, the Crusaders and the Spanish Christians and all these other Christian nations, they needed to make sense of their own defeat. So instead of mentioning that this is a success from the Muslims, that this is barbarism, this is violence, this is so on and so forth. But I say that this Fath Mecca is one of the best evidences as an argument against this notion. And that's why it's very important for us to look at it. Now the first thing is, you'll find that there was a treaty, we spoke about it before, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, and the Treaty of Hudaybiyah actually was amenable to other people coming in and attaching themselves to the protection of either the Qurashis or the Muslims. So you had two major tribes, the Khuza'ah and the Banu Bakr. And historically, the Qurashis were connected to the Khuza'ah tribe, which is a major tribe, and the Qurashis um, had the pact with Banu Bakr, the polytheist Qurashis. So in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the Muslims had allied themselves with Khuza'a and the Qurashi pagans had allied themselves with Banu Bakr, which means, as you'd know if you studied even 20th century history, that an attack on the tribe is like the attack on the protectors of the tribe. That's why in, even in modern history you had for example Austria-Hungary and then you had you know Italy and so on you had all these different people allying with each other you had the allies in second world war you had the allies and you had the axes and that one an attack on one nation meant the attack on all of the nations that were allied to those nations so this idea of allegiance was something which continues to this day it's not foreign even to European ears which is ironic because many people don't understand this or this context so what happened was the Banu Bakr decided to attack the Khuza'a. And don't forget, the Khuza'a were under the protection of the Muslim people. But what was more troubling and disturbing was that the Khuza'a decided to attack, sorry, the Banu Bakr decided to attack the Khuza'a with the tacit permission of the Qurashis, the pagan Arabs. They knew it. And they let it happen. And bear in mind, that from for a long time now the Muslims had been a dominant force. 
They could have gone in with force and broken the agreement. But as we said before, the word is your honor. And Islam, the idea is your word is your honor. You cannot break an agreement unless they break it first. And they did break it first. And they broke it by tacitly colluding with the Banu Bakr to attack the Khuza'ah, which was under the protection of the Muslims. And they had a joint allegiance together. And as such, now, officially, the contract had ended. However, the Prophet ﷺ did not pronounce, did not announce this to the people. Because had he announced this, they would have tried to A, either reconcile, or B, they would have been prepared for defense. In either case, it would not be in the interest, the political interest of the Muslim people, for such announcement to happen. And so what happened was, Abu Sufyan, who now, as we remember, he was the guy who was the general in Uhud and so on and so forth, now probably the undisputed leader. He is the undisputed leader of Mecca. Abu Sufyan is the undisputed because who is who else can take his place? But now he knows that there is a, the balance of power has changed. And as such, he goes to al Medina to try and seek some kind of reconciliation. But I looked at some of the hadiths and unfortunately... They're all inauthentic. I, I mean, I didn't come across a single uh, authentic uh, hadith about the story of Abu Sufyan going to Medina and so on. I only saw them in the Sirah literature, like, you know, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, and this one, that one. In fact, some of them are contradictory uh, in some of the minor details. Like, did he go to the Prophet Muhammad first, or did he go to Umar, uh, Umar and Abu Bakr Siddiq and Ali ibn Abi Talib first? But all of them bring a picture that he was basically rejected by everybody and Ali was the most soft with him and Umar was the most tough with him this is the bottom line that this is you know he came there trying to seek some kind of protection and the stories show that kind of thing in fact even one of the narrations <laughs> show that Abu Sufyan went to Al Hassan who was a boy to try and seek protection <laughs> I mean you imagine the levels here this is almost now sorry to say a humiliation ritual <laughs> what this is. I mean, when you go to because he knows the idea anyone can give you protection. And let me uh, pop quiz. When was the time when we spoke about last time where somebody gave somebody a pr protection who was non Muslim? So, so a Muslim gave a non Muslim protection. Who who remembers? Huh? Who? Yeah, yeah, go on. What's, what's, his, uh, what's her name? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Daughter? Fatima. No, Fatima. no, not Fatima. Zainab. 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 Yeah, Zainab. Yeah, there you go. Zainab. 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 And well, who, what's her husband called? Uh, <coughs> Abul Aas. Yeah, so that, so she was given it. She was given it's, it's unfair if you get involved here. <laughs> we usually ask you for the answers. Um, yeah, the, and, and the protection was given. And the protection was given. So this idea of an istit man. A listic man where you give protection to someone, if anyone gives it, anybody in the Muslim world, and as I said, we spoke about before, the Taliban, it's very, uh, you, you know you know best. <laughs> so, <laughs> tell me more. About the Taliban. <laughs> you guys should tell me. I, uh, from Afghanistan, because the, the idea of a state man still applies, doesn't it, in Afghanistan? Yeah, it's still, uh, so we have uh, a tribe in Afghanistan, so they are yeah. called Khogyani. Khog mean in Pashto pig. Wow. So it says that once a pig okay. seek refuge in a house of an, uh, somebody over there, and other people were after it, chasing it to kill it. So the people take a refuge and then fight. Become it become a fight between people. Really? Why you give protection to this animal? Because <laughs> they hate it, and they say no. This is a refuge that it takes. Mm. So it's called Khogyani nowadays. Oh, the name cool. of that. <laughs> say that again. Yeah, Khogyani. Khogyani. So some people say so. The idea of the, uh, so some people uh, in our country, they still think, and this is a reality, that for one Arab, we destroy the whole country. So after Bin Laden, <laughs> <laughs> for one Arab, we destroy the whole country. And this showed the level of importance of this uh, <laughs> man.
Yeah. <laughs> so after Osama bin Laden, he was in Afghanistan, and after this 9/11, <laughs> so the United States asked Taliban to hand hand him over. Yeah. And then uh, uh, they re rejected and said he is a Muslim and we need to protect him. If it, like, can I ask you a question? If if it was like, for example, uh, a non-Muslim, because and we know in Islam that yeah, you, yeah. a non-Muslim can get a stick man from the Muslims. Has that ever happened in, in Afghanistan? Still, still, it would happen because yeah. they feel that whoever, even a pig, if <laughs> they refuse, still you need to. That's a that's, good news for you, there, problem, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, that's that's a moment somebody will become proud of it because yeah. uh, they 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 will fight for it. Really? If, yeah, if somebody is coming to take him or take it, uh, that's why. So. So that, that's in Afghanistan. Is that is that Pashto culture? Like throughout all the all the yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, some sometimes so Afghans they uh, accuse the neighbor countries for handing over some people to Americans or others. And still, they they see that country as not having a ghira or some because why really? you hand over a Muslim to non-Muslim, mm. and you're giving because of money or political interest, whatever. Really, yeah. you need to destroy the country, but hand, keep him, Pakistan. hold him. Yeah. No, no, he's uh, Saudi Arabia. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh, what's up with Afghani, bro? No, 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 no. Come on, he's, uh, he's uh, as he said, they destroyed the country because wow. they want an Arab. <laughs> Yes. Somebody's a guest in your home. Yeah. In our culture. Can you tell us what your culture is and Kurdish culture? Yeah. And the, 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 can, can you <laughs> uh, no, but Ali doesn't know anything about uh, this. Uh, so, you teach him. <laughs> <laughs> so you pr you're obliged to protect them with your life. So I don't know. I tell him. Offering. So is it all Kurds? Would you say like that? Can you let the Kurdish man talk, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who's a guest in your home, yeah. or even your village. Mm. Yeah. They're obliged to protect the, yeah, the, with their Physically, lives. Yeah. yeah. So nobody can harm the guests. So it's in Kurdish culture, some Pashtun culture. What other, what other tribes are really good with this, would you say? Well, I'd say well, Central uh, Asian. Definitely people. not the Egyptians in this matter. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can't, I don't even know what, what tribes they have there. In <laughs> Somali culture, bro, is there anything there? I've got no clue, man. The worst past task. Do, 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 do they do it? I think Somali is quite principled as well. Yeah. No, no, but I'm saying, I'm saying this idea of a stick man. I'm trying to figure out what mm. tribes. Still have Arab, it. Arabs should have it. No, in Yemen, in like Yemeni culture, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I think uh, Chechens, Dagestanis probably yeah, have this. Central Asian, yeah. 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 Central Asian have it, yeah. Absolutely. Or do they have tribes like that as well? Yes, the tough yeah. people, bro. Mountain mm. people. Mm. Anybody, any mountain culture, mm. they will have something yeah. similar to this. Mm. But for us, if 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 you're a guest in my house, and within the four walls mm. that I occupy, I'm obliged to protect you with my life. It's like that as well in Sheikh in Saudi That's Arabia with some of the tribes, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. What's that story? Did you guys hear that story? I, I can't. Vaguely, really, I remember that these two men ran into. They gave protection, and then, like, it came at the cost where they lost their children. They set their kids on fire or something. Where Have you guys heard of it? Recently. No, no, no. It's. I heard it someone. It was it was like this. They gave them protection. They were saying, "Listen, we will kill your kids." They said, "Kill my really? kids." Yeah, he said, "Kill them." They killed the kids. No way. In, in a torture way. way. They said, "No, I'm still not letting them go." That's they how said, it works. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's like that. that. It, it usually yeah. works in the, like this. Is really mo mostly in the tribal cultures, isn't it? Like Baluchi as well. Baluchi. They Baluchis do yeah. that. Yeah. Baluchi, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Not only kids, they will destroy the whole community. Yeah, 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 they yeah, don't sure. care, but still they will keep that name that they protected oh. that guy. And they remember these stories go back 500 years. Yeah. You know, mm. you'll remember something. Mm. I'll remember when such and such protected my family. I think it's so honorable, isn't it? Mm. It's so it beautiful. Did, did the Mushrikeen like, have this? This yeah, kind of, yeah, they, yeah, they did, didn't they? Did, yeah, I think it's, so. it's, it's such a weird. Did they thing. have it, Sheikh the Mushrik? Did they have it as much? Mm. They did have that, yeah. yeah the Prophet yeah. Sallam himself yeah. was, you know, utilized it through yeah. one of the heads of I mean, Quraysh I mean, the let's, be, let's be fair to the Europeans. When he came they back have, from Ta'if. Mm. Oh, the Europeans have it as well. Of course, they have it in the form of citizenship, <laughs> because they will protect you so long as you have the passport. Yeah, if not, but if you, if it's the same guy, but you are in another country, they'll kill you, bro. <laughs> they, 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 don't <laughs> <laughs> they don't give a damn. They don't give a damn. If you're a different color, then it's yeah. yeah. It, it, it's um, reciprocal as well. Yeah. Anything in tribal culture is reciprocal. Mm. So we have a saying: it's it's uh, one glass of water. Mm. Equals one hundred years of loyalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. if you if if yeah, I yeah. drink a glass of water in your home, yeah. give me that water so I can give it to my wife. <laughs> 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 they'll, they'll still have a problem with it. They'll still have a problem with it. By the way, in our country, we say we say tea. Mm. Uh, tea has a, if you have a share like a tea or something. Absolutely. 
Really, yeah? That's, yeah. that's really, really profound. Well, nowadays, Europeans, they send them to Rwanda. Somebody sick Europeans, they send them to Rwanda. Rwanda is a beautiful country, by the way. <laughs> The, 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 the guys that are being sent there, they're probably thinking that they're going to go to some shanty towns or something like that. They're coming out of East London or West London or something. They, go, they land in Rwanda and say, this is better than where I was before. <laughs> Rwanda is the Wakanda. You've seen it before, haven't you? Yeah, I, there? I was there a few weeks ago. Mm. Really? Rwanda is amazing. It's amazing, it's but it's so clean, isn't it? I've yeah, seen yeah. the vlogs and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Why beautiful, organised. Why Rwanda? It's, it's the most organised African country. No, but why are they sending them there? Yeah, yeah, there's a deal. They pay for it. Yeah. Why they are countries, Rwanda is a very organized and very money motivated uh, <laughs> country if the yeah. price is right. Okay, so <clears throat> that was a humiliation ritual <laughs> that, that he had to go through. <laughs> so, um, so what's really interesting is that the Sira writers say that the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell anybody about what he was going to do. He didn't even tell his wife, he didn't, you know, Aisha, and he didn't even tell uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq. He's the closest friend. He didn't tell anybody uh, about anything. And 10,000 fighters gathered. Um, and there's a f famous story. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but there's a famous story of Hatib ibn Abi Balta. Mm. Now, this guy called Hatib ibn Abi Balta, basically he sent a letter to his family in Mecca warning them that the Prophet ﷺ was going to come and that the Muslims are coming. Um, and when the Muslims found out about that, you know, Omar wanted to kill him. He said, let me kill this munafiq, let me kill this guy, this kafir. He made takfir, <laughs> made takfir of him, which is very in interesting and important, actually, because the Prophet ﷺ corrected this notion. He said he wasn't a kafir, he wasn't a disbeliever, and that, in fact, because he was a person of Badr. Now, there's so many discussions about this in Aqeedah. They say, well, the reason why, uh, the, why uh, the Prophet ﷺ gave him concession was because he was a Badri was because he went to Badr. Others say, no, it wasn't, it couldn't be, because how could it be that Badr makes you into, it gives you uh, Aqeedah immunity, mm. for example. Like, you know, in the Quran it says, uh, it says, um, for example, Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad himself, that I, I will destroy your deeds and you will be of the losers. Allah is saying that to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's saying, if you do shirk, I'll destroy you. Mm -hmm. Which means that when it comes to aqidah issues or issues to do with theology, no one has an exception card. You can't say, oh, because I went to Badr, or I went there, therefore I can do shirk and I'm kufr. What was that shirk? No, that's what I'm saying. So the idea is that you have a group of people that, out there that say that if you, if you ally with the disbelievers in any wajm al awjuh any way, shape or form, if you ally with the disbelievers, you're a disbeliever. And that is usually the view of the takfirists, people like ISIS, people like uh, Al-Qaeda. This is their argument, by the way. Al-Qaeda make this argument. They make the argument that, you know, it's, you're a disbeliever because you're allying yourself with a disbelieving nation who believe in Kufan and Shirk. Because you're allying yourself with them, therefore, you're a disbeliever like them. But the story of Hatib ibn Abi Balta. Because the reason why he done, he done this, he sent a letter, he was asked, why did you do this? He said, the reason why I did it is because everyone else has a connection with Mecca. Everyone else has people to protect them there. I don't have anyone there. So I wanted to tell my, because I got my mum is there, my sisters are there. I wanted to tell them just in case if anything happened, I could say, well, I warned you before. I could get some favor from them. Yeah, so they don't kill me. So basically it was dunya we maslah. It was to do with the dunya. Okay. Now it was clearly wrong. It was haram. You could even see it was kabir al kabair. It was very bad deed, very bad sin, very bad whatever. But the fact that the Prophet Muhammad did not call it shirk or kufr is evidence that it was not shirk or kufr. Which is also evidence that allying yourself with disbelievers, even if it may look like it's against the believers, is not always an evidence that that person has committed kufr and shirk. Even though Umar al-Khattab came to that conclusion in the first place, he was corrected by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The the issue of Hatib ibn Balta actually is one of the worst thorns in the side of the takfirist movements. Like when I have a discussion with them, and they say, "Well, you know, uh, this and that." If you bring the case of Hatib ibn Balta and ask them to explain it on their worldview, 
because they think that if you connect yourself with the disbelievers in any way, shape or form, that you become like them. They, they all say, usually the, the defense is, yeah, the defense is, he was Badri. The reason why the Prophet ﷺ gave him concession is because he had a Badr. Yeah, he went to Badr. But then the question would be, how could going to Badr, which is in a, how could that give you concession to do whatever you want? Do you know, you know the, the hadith that says that those who go into Badr, it's as, as if Allah said, do whatever you want. Yeah. It's as if they've taken that literally. Yeah. So what I say, Islam has become like a Christianity. You believe in one thing, is it die for the sins, finished. You can commit shirk even. What, 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 what is this? What are you saying? So what I'm saying is that is the view of takfir, of people like Al-Qaeda and ISIS and other groups, is readily defeated or repudiated or refuted by the case study of Hatim ibn Abi Balta. Oh sorry, Hatim ibn Abi Balta, not Hatim. <laughs> His name is Hat. Because he done something. Like for example, let me give you let me give you a practical example. If someone today, okay, he he, for example, connected themselves to the United States of America in a way to get some money. Yeah. He started doing certain things and maybe he did it for, even if Jesus, sorry to say. Yeah, I'm gonna go for I'll find this. He was a bit of a spy for, for the MI5. Can we make takfir just on that? No. They would say maybe, yes, you should kill him because he's a kafir. But I'm saying really this case study would have to now take precaution before making takfir on this issue. Do you see what I mean? Because of the case of Hatib now, we have to now, the whole this case has made takfir more difficult on the basis of allying yourself with a people who are disbelieving people. For a purpose. And this is connected to this idea of Al-Hukm Bughayr under Allah or a ruling with what other than what Allah has revealed. It's Tawalli, the idea of connection. There's so many things here which we don't have the scope to talk about, but it's important for you to know that this is a uh, important and vibrant discussion. Um, Uh, the uh, miraculous aspect of the story is that the Prophet ﷺ already knew about this. Yeah. And remember, the, the, Wallahi, this is such a powerful angle in terms of arguing for the case of Islam. He not only knew, because what Hatab did was he got this letter and he sent it with this woman who was like inconspicuous woman. And she put it between her braids or in her hair or something like that and she went away and she was going to give it to the people of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ told Ali ibn Abi Talib and another Sahabi, which I forget who it is now, Zubair ibn Awam, he told them both to go and get the letter. He said, is, listen to this, the Prophet ﷺ said, it's going to be with this woman in this place at this time. And it's, going to, it's not going to be there. Look at what happened. Imagine this, yeah? Ali ibn Abi Talib approached the woman, and uh, Zubair ibn Awam, yeah? They approached her and said, give me the letter. She goes, what are you talking about? I don't have any letter. He goes, Ali said, we have not been lied to. Uh, Allah, uh, the Prophet has not been lied to, and we have not been lied to. Give me the letter. Now, this, by the way, is it's on the same level of in qalaha faqat sadaq. You know when uh, when Abu Bakr Siddiq, when the Asra al Maraj happened, mm -hmm. and and they were saying your friend is saying such and such and such. He said, oh, if he said it, it's, it's telling the truth. Ali, now you've got a woman here. It's not visible that she has any letters with her, mm -hmm. but. Ali is saying, if the Prophet told us, there's no doubt you have the letter. He's not saying, maybe we got it wrong, maybe it's the wrong woman. Like, do you know what I mean? You see the, the confidence? No, no, you got the letter. You got the letter. Give me the letter. Give me the letter. Oh, no, no, no. Give me the letter, otherwise we're going to strip you now, sorry to say. Which shows you that it's okay to strip. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only kidding. But no, yeah. no, no, you're not kidding. No, no, but it shows you that there are certain situations, yeah, the yeah, dire yeah. situations, yeah. Now I was going to say something completely different. Yeah. But the idea is that she said, turn around. She also had this kind of idea of haya. And she took the letter from her hair or wherever she had it. And she gave it to them. The letter was there. And it said what we said that it said. That Hatib said such and such to her family members. But the point is, is that this is a miraculous aspect. The fact that he was able to spot that. The last person to become muhajir in Islam was Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad and he was coming 
to Al Madinah at the same time as the Prophet uh, as they were as they were, uh, the, the army was marching. So they kind of saw them like that. Abu Sufyan was given protection. Remember, he was searching for protection from anyone now, from the boy, from this one, the humiliation ritual, and all that stuff. <laughs> but he was given. He was eventually given. <laughs> he was given protection by Al Abbas. Al Abbas is new convert. New Muslim, and his story of conversion is interesting. The way he converted once again was due to something that no one could have known. Uh, the Prophet said that you said such and such to your wife in your room, and this shows you, by the way, you'll see a trend. A lot of people becoming Muslim in the companions of the Prophet due to information that they couldn't, that Prophet couldn't have known, which shows you, as we were talking before the break, the idea of prophecies, yes, in giving da'wah is something very powerful. And not only that, in the old scriptures, like the Bible, it says, and you will know them by their prophecies. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Like in Deuteronomy 18, verse 20. Yeah. You know, that you will know that one of the portents is that, you know, that they will be, they will prophesy, and when they prophesy, they will not be false in that. So the idea is, when the Prophet ﷺ is giving information that they couldn't have known because he wasn't there, he wasn't present, that's almost as good as a prophecy. A prophecy is more powerful, by the way. And... Note that these people, they only needed just one. one. One equivalent of prophecy and they became Muslim. Nowadays you give someone 10 or 20 predictions of the future and they still would not be accepting it. Very, very specific predictions of Islam in the future about the interest, about STDs, about the buildings and the infrastructure, everything. They still say, you know what? There's more that needs to be said. How many do you need? You see? So the prophecies, I think, is a very powerful way of bringing people to the religion of Islam. So he becomes Muslim. And what's really interesting and what's very powerful, and I'll tell you why this is interesting and important in fact as well, is that the Prophet he gave, he, he said that whoever enters the Hamandakhala Baytahu Kana Aminan, or Kama Khasallam, whoever goes into the house of Abu Sufyan is going to be safe. There were sanctuaries, public sanctuaries that the Prophet designated that if you go into those public sanctuaries, that you'll be safe. And one of those places was the Haram, al Mecca, And the other one was the house of Abu Sufyan. Just to maybe help him regain his prestige after such humiliation. That he can now still grant in a sign, kind of indirect way, his people a kind of protection, protection which is given to him by his seniors, in this case the Muslim people. But why this is an important hadith to memorize or to know is because one of the attacks of Islam, they say, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ came into Mecca, as we're coming to see now, when he came into Mecca, is a very famous hadith that says, Idhabu Yeah? Leave because now you are let go. Now the hadith mentions that everyone was there, and the Prophet ﷺ said that, you know, you're forgiven to the people. You're forgiven. He said, "Idhabu fa antum Some scholars I've seen have made tahsin of that hadith. They said the hadith is Hassan. It's also mentioned, "Let tathrib alaykum liyum." The same thing that was mentioned by Yusuf alayhi salam that there's no blame on you today. Yani go because you are uh, you are let go. Yani you are the tulaqa. Some some muhaddiths have said that this hadith is weak. Some some muhaddiths have said the hadith of "Idhabu fa antum is a weak hadith. And as such, they say there is no evidence, it's an interesting line of argumentation, they say there's no evidence that when the Prophet ﷺ came into Mecca, that he actually granted protection and safety and forgiveness to the people. That's what they say. They, because they say, if you are relying on the hadith that says, Idhabu fa antumun tulaqa, go because you are, you know, you are let go and so on, you are forgiven, or, then that hadith is weak. That I'm giving you a, a higher level interrogation. So the response to that interrogation is to say, well, actually, we have this other hadith. Forget, if you don't like the hadith, find some scholars have made tahsin of that hadith. But there's another hadith which says, that مَنْ دَخَلَ بَيْتَ أَبِي سُفْيَانْ فَهُوَ amin. Whoever goes into the house of Abu Sufyan is amin, is protected. Whoever goes into the Kaaba is protected. Whoever goes to this other place is protected. So in other words, this other hadith, it substitutes the idhabu fa antum for those who say, well, there's no evidence that the Prophet ﷺ forgave the people when he went into Mecca. Because let me let me give you a, a situation. If someone came, Ali, 
and said to you in speaker's corner somewhere else, I said, look, what's the evidence huh, that someone, I sh maybe I should have done this the other way around, right? Because now I'll give you the answer. But let's just say, what's the evidence that when the Prophet ﷺ went into Mecca that he forgave the people? I mentioned... Yeah, you mentioned this. Yeah, yeah so, but if you, so if you had mentioned Ithabu Fahintum Zulqa, he could say, well, if he's high level, he say, look, you know, it's weak. Mm. He said, but there's another hadith. You see, you see what we're doing here? Yeah. We're, we're covering all bases. Mm. So that's a very important uh, hadith. You might think it's trivial, but it's, a, it's, it's important. There's another narration that strengthens it. Which one? Oh, it's authentic. Similar, that's authentic. So this yeah, one yeah, week. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add yeah. a point to what you just said? So the Prophet ﷺ gave this mercy to his enemies, right? Mm. Now, if you look at warfare today and you look at the experts of warfare like Robert Greene, who's spoken at West Point, he's taken as the authority. Law 15 of the uh, 48 Laws of Power is crush your enemies totally. Mm. But here the Prophet ﷺ is not following that law. Mm. So what we find is that even military strategists today haven't achieved the level mm. at which the Prophet ﷺ was operating at. Mm. Because from the Allies' perspective, when they destroyed Dresden, when they did these things, there was no idea of mercy. But Islam actually has certain inbuilt mechanisms which the Western world doesn't have, which other military philosophers like Sun Tzu doesn't have. And what it goes to show is that you can't take the best tools in Western academia and try to measure the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ is the standard by which everything else exactly. is measured. Exactly. And that's exactly what Montgomery Watt yeah. says. He says that we need to see uh, about the Prophet's um, uh, character if there's something we can incorporate rather than the op opposite yeah. way around. So which Muslim nation or armies has ever gone and massacred men, women and children? Like directly, direct command? Where? Well, Muslim nations, I mean, you can make the argument of the Muahidun and stuff like that. No, I wouldn't where, where, did they go and men, uh, women, children? Okay, yeah, it can be. I don't be. know, but what I'm saying is that d d I would be careful not to make a historical case because you can always find some crazy guys like ISIS, for example. Yeah. yeah? So instead of making a historical case, if you make a religious case, then what, we, what we're defending here is yeah. the Qur'an and the Sunnah rather than the actions of the Muslims for yeah. a thousand four hundred years because there's always going to be a group of Muslims yeah, that have happen. done some horrible things. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> should, we, should we have a quick break and pray, Maghrib? Let's have a break and pray, Maghrib. We've done a lot of uh, hard work, mashallah, today. We got to come back after. 20 minutes yeah. after that was there. Okay, so um, what happened was, so they had this, the Prophet ﷺ assembled 10,000 people and they were now marching towards Mecca and there's some hadith talking about what kind of dress the Prophet ﷺ was wearing he's wearing like a, you know, the head covering and there's, a, there's some hadith, that's a sahih hadith there's some other hadith talking about how he was postured saying that he was very humbly postured like, you know, his, he wasn't coming in brazenly he was coming in now as a conqueror but he wasn't coming in brazenly which shows you the demeanor of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ that he was deplete from this grandiosity. He didn't have a grandiose demeanor. He wasn't about that. Which, by the way, itself is an interesting thing. And the Prophet ﷺ told them not to fight anybody. Now, there was one exception to that, they, where the Prophet ﷺ allowed fighting to happen for, he said, Sa'atan bin Nahar, like an hour in the daytime. And that was because, if you think about it psychologically, if these tribes didn't settle their differences. Uh, don't forget the Khuza'a had been attacked by the Banu Bakr. And they wanted to get retribution. If, they didn't, if he didn't allow any of that, then it could have caused more issues. Because the thing is, resentment and anger and embitterment, if, if it's not dealt with through an outlet, it can actually cause more problems. So it's a very strategic thing. But it was only, it was a limited thing. Clearly, what was meant was for there to be complete peace and he came in very humbly but he destroyed the idols this is a very symbolic thing it was said that there was 360 idols around the Kaaba you'll know the story where he destroyed them with the stick you know he pointed at them and then they fell on their faces and broke and so on and there were some skirmishes that happened and took place now what in terms of our remit people will come and say well you're saying that the Prophet was very forgiving and that he forgave everybody and you know he was very magnanimous, very forgiving. But we have hadiths and I've seen this all plastered all over the anti-Islamic websites. And in fact, I've heard it in Speaker's Corner. And in fact, I've heard it from many different people that attack Islam. They say, well, there were these figures that the Prophet 
said that he, you have to go kill them. So it wasn't an all-out, you know, mercy for everybody. You're saying that the Prophet is a mercy for mankind. But there are nine people, if you add up all the people and all the hadiths and so on, it's about nine people altogether, which the Prophet clearly didn't for forgive. So we're going to deal with uh, each of them, and I think you should be aware of this in terms of da'wah and handling objections when it comes to these figures, because each of them had a story. We'll start with, um, so you can see the list here of the people not spared in, in the conquest. Well, the first one is Akram ibn Abu Jahl. In fact, he was spared. Um, from what I read about him, he wasn't, he wasn't killed. The one who was killed was Abdullah ibn Akhtal. This individual who was a very malicious man, very malignant individual. And now, humiliation style, ran to the Kaaba and started to hold on to the the curtains of the sitar, or what would you call that, the cloth of the Kaaba. And they came to the Prophet and said, Why, what should we do with him? He's in the Kaaba. He said, kill him. And he was killed. This is one figure that was killed. Why was he killed? And this is the question I want to ask you guys. Why was he... Is he with the poet? So who, tell me, tell me why he was killed. Let's, let's start with Abdullah, Abdurrahman. What do you have about him? I haven't got anything about him right now. Okay, well I'll give His you. Name, I think Abdullah bin Khattal. Uh, sorry, is it? I think it's been spelled in both ways. So this is the claim. The claim is uh, this is a good thing you brought us up. The claim is this is examples of blasphemy laws in action. The reason why these people were killed is because they were producing poetry. And it shows you Islam is a very intolerant religion because it shows you blasphemy laws in action. And it also is an evidence of the fact that uh, it, there was no forgiveness, as you claim. Yeah, so what? <laughs> no, but before we get to so what, let's, let's assess this. No, 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 but it's, it's very clear. Why, why am I using your Yasi? I was speaking to one guy and he's yeah. like, yeah, but you know, if you, uh, you know, I was talking about capital punishment. Yeah. I was like, yeah, like I said, look, imagine... You have a tree, it's a mango tree, I have a tree that's a apple tree. Yeah, you say to me, you can eat from my tree. I'm like, okay. I'm like, but I don't want you to eat from my tree. You can't mm -hmm. come and say, but I, I don't care, do you allow me to eat from your tree? Just because you have a um, a world view, that's you, bro. How does that? How is that a yardstick to uh, come to objective uh, uh, morality? No, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's a fine so, line so of argumentation. Case. Like, yeah, that's, that's it. We it get is. to that, but we want to know more about these characters first, because we, if we know their background, then we'll have. So uh, what I'm going to do is this is the first and probably last time we're going to do this is I'm going to give you five minutes with the person next to you to research every uh, one of those names. I'm going to give you which names. I'll give. Huh? You, no, he's not in the. He's not in the list. Really? Not in Fatah Mecca. Not in Fatah before. Yeah. Was he killed before? Yeah, but we know he was killed. He was. We went through him actually. We're, we're talking about Fatah Mecca in the co in the context of Fatah Mecca. These are the nine names that you'll come across if you do istikhara of the hadith. Okay. Now, if my question is, who are they? Why? What was their background? And why were they killed? And how can you explain this? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to give you the names. So I'll give you... Um, I'm, go I'm, I'm going to give you um, Abdurrahman. And you have the Sheikh to help as well. Akram ibn Abi Jahl. I'm going to give you Abdullah ibn, <laughs> ibn Akhtal or Ibn Khattal. I don't know which one. It's a Khattal, right? But Ibn Khattal. And I will give you guys the two poet women, uh, Fartana and Sarah. Yeah? Oh, are you giving us a specific Yeah, and you do the research. Okay, who about us two? So you guys can have. Uh, Let's see. Give us the worst of the worst of enemies. Right? Okay, no, no. Uh, Ali and Zubair, yeah? Who? Zubair. Well, you, you can have Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh and uh, Miqyas. Well, how do you even spell that? It's, it's there on the slide. The yeah. Yeah, okay. And you guys have the rest. Yeah. Okay. So, no, you, the, yeah, they, they have the rest. 789. Five minutes, we'll come back. All right. <laughs> Let's have a feedback uh, session. Let's start with Ak Akrimah. Uh, what have you found out? 
Is that who you done? Yeah. Okay, go let's start with him. Okay, yeah. So uh, first, let's frame it correctly. Yeah. Some mm. people might perceive uh, this whole conversation about poetry and the uh, Ridda laws as, uh, you know, having, for example, expression of free speech or poetic expression or freedom of speech, and that's infringing on that. So if we frame it correctly, Abdullah ibn Khattal, he was staying in Medina and he was being served by a slave. And what happened was a man from the Khuzaya tribe, this particular slave, uh, didn't wake up in time to serve him his food. So he got upset and he ultimately killed him. Say that again. So so he was actually in Medina, with yeah. this, this man, Abdullah ibn Khattal, and he was mm -hmm. Muslim at this time. Mm -hmm. He was being served by a slave mm -hmm. and he was waiting for the slave to wake up and give him his food. So he's a murderer. Yeah, so he's a murderer. He killed him. When he killed the slave, he actually said, if I go back and you know tell the Prophet Wasallam, he's going to obviously give me the, the penal code, the qisas. So he said, let me go to the enemy mm. and let me tell them that not obviously not tell them this story, but let me tell them that I'm coming as a poet mm -hmm. to help you in the propaganda against the Prophet mm. Interestingly enough, the two slave girls are also involved in this were his slave girls. Uh, so which one? Sara and Fartana? Fartana. Sara and Fartana, yeah. So, in, uh, so in they were complicit? He's, yeah, and he's a murderer basically. Mm. So this has nothing to do with you know expression of free speech and got everything to do with. See, this is fantastic. This is a very interesting thing. You'll find that this is a common trend. I'm, I'm sure you guys are very researched, but this this idea of these guys are not just expressing quote unquote free speech or whatever it is, or attacking or criticizing. This is um, people who have usually had criminal records and have been murderers. Uh, so you, you, this is a very good point. So he's a murderer. He had to be killed. Yeah, this could be a qisas. Yeah. What happened in Fath Makkah? So what is qisas for those yeah. who don't know what the word means? Yeah. What does qisas mean? Uh, what do you call it? To Retribution. Yeah, when some, life somebody kills someone life else, for life for life. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. Okay, uh, who else did you have? Uh, did you have Abdullah ibn... Uh, that was Ali, right? Yeah, go ahead, Ali. Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh. No, no, that was... Uh, yeah. He was a scribe of the Prophet. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was the one of the first apostates. Yes. Um, um, he would, I think he would change what was written. Mm. So what it was is that I came across the tafsir of um, Surah Al-Mu'minun, right? And there's a verse in there that says, Allahu ahsan al that, uh, you know, glory be to Allah, the Ahsan al the best of creators. And what was proposed was that this guy, Abdullah ibn Abi Sarh, he would hear something from the Prophet, and he would say that, you know, I used to make my own thing up and write it down. And as such, you know, um, as such, uh, I didn't have trust anymore that this was a true prophet because I was one of the scribes of the prophet, yes, mm -hmm. and I was writing it down. Now, first and foremost, I looked at some of the hadith relating to this, uh, you know, this exegesis because this was found in like Tabari's tafsir and Ibn Kathir and so on. And I found that the hadith itself was weak. Like the hadith... The hadith of this story, this whole story happening, is a questionable hadith. But let's say it's a true hadith. Let's play devil's advocate and say it's a true hadith, for the sake of argument. If someone is trying to misguide the people, and trying to make them, th not only he has apostated, but he's now trying to make other people apostate, yeah. what would he say? He would say something like that. Say, I was a scribe, I used to say something, and he'd make a story up, so that people would think, okay, it couldn't be the word of... Uh, God, because it was Abdullah bin Abi Sarha's words, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is that he was, what happened with him, he made, the Prophet ﷺ made some kind of like a, a movement, and he wanted him to be killed, okay? However, he was not killed, he was actually spared. And then asked the inquirer, the Prophet, like, what, what, you know, he said, did you not understand that this was some kind of a movement? But he didn't give a movement. Mm. It happened, mm. uh, Rasman bin Affan was his brother, yeah, from breastfeeding. breastfeeding. Mm. Yeah, so he went to the Prophet. He, he took Abdullah bin Sarah, essentially mm. his mm. brother, to the Prophet mm. Alaihi Wasallam mm -hmm. for the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam to forgive him. Mm. So the way it's done is through pleading allegiance. Mm. So Abdullah bin Sarah would extend his arms to the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam, and the Prophet Alaihi Wasallam didn't do anything. He didn't hint to anything, but he didn't accept it immediately. Mm. He did it once, he did it twice. At the third time, the Prophet ﷺ extended his hand and accepted the allegiance, meaning mm. that he's a Muslim mm. and all forgiven. So when he left, the Prophet ﷺ looked at the Sahaba and told them, uh, 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 Wasn't there among you uh, a person that 
understand. Person. Yeah, a Russian person. Mm. So they understood now because the Prophet ﷺ commanded them to kill Abdullah ibn Sarah. Mm. So he came mm. and nobody did anything. And mm. they, you should have understood that when I did an excel my hand mm. first time, second time, that uh, stand up just and kill him. So they told the Prophet ﷺ, why did you hint? Why did you create any type of movement? So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that uh, a prophet should never act in this fashion or this way. Mm. Meaning uh, it's a type of backstabbing. Mm. Did I say specifically blink or not? Yeah, uh, 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 that's not acceptable for a, for a prophet to do. Mm. So, yeah, uh, uh, mm. using... Uh, now, it's a very important clarification. What I understood, Sheikh, was also Abdullah ibn Basarah was a, was, became a governor afterwards. Yeah, after that, uh, he's, he's uh, one of the main guys that opened uh, e e Egypt or the first... Uh, uh, I think the first uh, uh, yeah, Muslim that conquered during the time of Muawiyah, the sea. Mm. When there was an exhibition to utilize uh, navy forces, let's say. Mm. So I'd like to understand. Why is the process of one who's dead like... Like, okay, can we say that all of these nine people, if they accepted Islam, would they be forgiven? Yeah, that's between them and Allah. So, so if they did that, they would have been forgiven? No, uh, not necessarily. Okay, I mean, that's interesting. Uh, let's say if, uh, if one of them became a Muslim secretly, he may be forgiven, but the ruling should. But in the case of Abdullah bin Abi Sarh, yeah. the Prophet ﷺ, even though he pleaded allegiance yeah. and showed that he wants to enter in the fold of Islam, the ruling stands. But when he uh, it was done once and twice, then the Prophet exonerated him so, later so, on. Okay, so Shaykh, so if they accept Islam, because remember the hadith of the, the the man who came and said there was a man I was going to strike, and he said I accept Islam. He said he said did you look in his heart? So the <coughs> thing is, doesn't Islam him becoming a Muslim and negate the killing of him? Or are you necessary? Unless it's murder, for example. If it's murder, then yeah, you have to kill him. Uh, but for example, let's say if a person uh, uh, mocks the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, insults the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even if he accepts Islam? So even if he, that's the position of Ibn Taymi, for example, even if he accepts Islam, he must be killed. Mm. But, but does that, that mean Muslim? that uh, uh, things are not forgiven between him and Allah Azza wa That's mm. a matter between him and Allah. So that's the matter of the year after. He dies as a Muslim, alhamdulillah. Yeah, so uh, let's say uh, in case of Abdullah bin Khattab, for example, if he entered Islam. Mm. So one cannot assume that uh, it will not be forgiven between him and Allah Azza wa but the ruling stands unless the Prophet uh, okay, purified right. in this dunya, yeah. in that sense, isn't it? Like, it's possible, yeah. It's possible, yeah. So Abdullah bin Sarah, we have a particular situation that Rasulullah didn't override the ruling, even if he shows uh, that he wants to enter the Is there anything else that we know that he done, Sheikh, that you've come across? The, the, the well-known thing that he done, that he, he was a Muslim, he was one of... Uh, of Kutab uh, al-Wahi. Uh, so when he... Uh, uh, Islam went back and he was spreading the propaganda that I, uh, that uh, Muhammad will just write down whatever I decide to him. Mm. Could, couldn't we say that that's infringing on national security? Because he knows that if people do believe him, it's going to be outlaw. Yeah, of course. Mm. And there's no way. Yeah, he, yeah. yeah that's, uh, he took uh, such a dangerous role. Yeah, yeah. When you spread that rumor that uh, he's not a truth or prophet, actually. The Quran is something that I established. Yeah. I just recite something and he, yeah. he writes it down. Mm. That's a problematic position. Absolutely. How would you respond to that, Sheikh? So, 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 let's say someone came to you and, and had that position. How would you, how would you respond? Like, sure. you know, the Orientalists, they use this in their websites and stuff like that. This is, uh, say, look, this is an example of uh, the manipulation of Wahi or manipulation of the Quran. What's the good response that you've come across for this? There, there are a couple of things that one can respond. For example, nobody mm -hmm. essentially believed him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they knew the Arab at the time that this is something that even the Prophet ﷺ himself cannot mm -hmm. bring forth yeah. mm -hmm. from himself. Mm -hmm. Nobody believed Abdullah bin Sarah that the, the, the linguistics within the Quran, the beautiful, mm -hmm. beauty of it, no, is no, something no. that uh, Abdullah bin Sarah, uh, nobody took him seriously. Mm -hmm. If well, that was the case, then... 
And he wasn't the only scribe, was he? So it yeah, it, it wasn't but the only. Yeah. Challenge that Allah says, bring to produce something like he would say, look, I'll, I'll produce it, because he's remember he, <laughs> he would come. And then yeah. why didn't he produce it? Yeah, yeah, so he, he, yeah, he was not claiming to create a Quran. <coughs> but he was changing the words. Whatever you do, but if the claim yeah. is that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was getting it from him, then the challenge that says produce something like it is against him because it's written by him. Now he can't produce it. It's, do you get what I'm saying? He cannot produce the own challenge he's doing if the Quran is from him. Well, I think uh, what he was doing, when the Prophet ﷺ was telling him something, he would write something in, yeah. and then he would ask the Prophet, is it right? He would say, no problem with those words. That was his claim. Was it? Yeah. yeah. Because there are a couple of narrations. One of them, you know, Al-Ahrav al -Sabah. Oh. At the beginning of Islam, for example, there was not big of a deal in changing certain endings of the verses oh. with the names of Allah mm -hmm. to simplify matters. Oh, okay. So the only condition at that time was don't uh, end uh, a verse of the Quran that is talking about torture with something that is uh, talking about mercy, mercy for example. Mm -hmm. Then uh, everything was set firmly. So he, uh, uh, there's a certain narration that shows that at a certain time he was trying like to t test the Prophet, changing, and the Prophet would accept it. So he became he created those assumptions, going beyond. Yani, Mm -hmm. Isn't the best response the fact that he himself said I was lying afterwards? Yeah, not just that, but he he became one of the propagators of Islam. Mm -hmm. And how can they use that against us if he yeah, said yeah. He, he, if he yeah. believes the Quran is not the word of, let's say, the word of him, uh, according to his claim, mm. then why later on he yeah. is a proper Muslim? Yeah, exactly that. But also, a lot of these hadiths, you'll be surprised, are weak. Mm. Yeah. So that this is an important, uh, important point. Well, this one is weak, yeah? Which one? The one you mentioned was the one about uh, the one I said that was weak, which I yeah. looked at, was the the famous one they use for Tabarakallahu Ahsan al Khaliqin, in chapter twenty three of the Quran, where it says that he said it himself, because what it says in that hadith is that, oh, I said that myself, and then it was and then it was revealed. So that was weak. Is there anything yeah. else that's weak? The, the claim that he used to. Uh, uh, no, that's the, that's the main one they use, to be honest. That's, is that weak? That's the main. Yeah, I came across. I don't think the hadith is uh, okay. is is, str is strong. Okay, so. Now, uh, Miqyas, who done Miqyas? Yeah, he, he murdered an innocent man and he fled to Mecca. And what happened to him? That was it. I think he was killed. Okay, so can you see that the theme of murder is coming back, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, what about Fartana and Sarah? Mm. I think Fartana was a singer mm -hmm. and uh, she used to be a servant or slave for the guy Abdullah ibn Khattal. Mm. And uh, she was singing and she was somehow uh, disrespecting the Prophet mm. And later on, I think she was spared as well. Spared as well. She was one of them was spared for sure. Which one uh, was spared? I think it was uh, Sarah was spared. Yeah, I think, but we've read also that. Yeah, Fatana was. might have been spared as well. I think there's a different, different opinion. opinion. Mm. Mm. And, and I, in either case, you couldn't establish a ruling on this because it was. We don't know uh, who's spared, who's not spared. Yeah. I think she was ordered to be mm. killed, but mm. then later on she fled somewhere. Mm. She kept hiding, hide over there. Later on she come and she, I think, asked for forgiveness. And mm -hmm. according to this uh, information, the Prophet has not forgive her. Okay. Forgive her, yeah. What, what, what is the information that you've got? Uh, here it mentioned there is a... Fatana 3, go 3. Forgive it's a... Uh, Waqidi, mm. Al Maghazi, and the second volume. Okay. Okay. Two, three. Let's see what the Sheikh says. Okay, thank That's you. Right. There are th three opinions. Yep. Essentially, both were, were killed. Mm. One, both were exonerated, forgiven. And one, uh, the first was killed, the latter fled, and then she was killed later on. Mm. So we, so we don't no know what happened with it. Yeah, we don't know. We're being honest. Okay. Yeah, controversial. Based on weak hadiths. A waq hadith is extremely weak. Is, a, is it Shia, Sheikh? Is it? No. Well, the Shia use him quite often, quite often isn't it? Okay. Um, who else? Um, who, who had who? 7, 8, and 9. Who has 7, 8, and 9? You guys? Oh, yeah. I got uh, mm. Haber. Haber hmm? ibn al Aswad. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very, uh, very pernicious enemy of uh, the Prophet. And Islam, he he inflicted a grievous injury on Zainab, the daughter mm. of the Prophet, mm. uh, when she was pregnant and she was migrating from Makkah to Medina. Uh, he <laughs> pulled her off of a camel, 
viciously uh, to the ground and she was badly hurt and she had miscarriage as a result of that. Um, but uh, he committed many other crimes and he wanted to to basically run away to Farsa, Iran. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, w basically he came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, he forgave him. Mm. And, uh, you know, that he was forgiven. So. Mm. Okay. And what about Harith ibn uh, Nuqayz? He was a chief of the Khazraj tribe mm -hmm. and he was killed for treachery because um, they, him and some other tribes in Medina conspired to betray the Prophet Okay, so they wanted to kill. They wanted to get physical there. You can see this. All of these are examples mm -hmm. of that. Um, Wahshi, we know the story. Of, everyone here knows the story of Wahshi, or the, the man who killed Hamza and then was forgiven by the Prophet. And the Prophet said, just because of the traumatic experience of it, he said, I don't want to you know, see you effectively. But he was forgiven. Now, um, the controversy surrounding this is relating to freedom of speech as well. They say, look, well, these are, they usually use this as an example, especially the two poets, girls. They say, look, Islam is a religion that is fundamentally against freedom of speech. Because as you can see, you had these two women who were, you know, uh, killed as a result of producing criticizing poetry against the Prophet Muhammad. So, Abdul Rahman, how would you respond to that? Uh, firstly, I would say that they were, all of them, all of these poets were inciting violence against the Prophet mm -hmm. And if you understand uh, the environment at that time, there was group A and group B. They mm -hmm. both wanted to kill each other. Mm -hmm. And there is, there is no middle person who just wants to speak their mind. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. And then if that was truly true, then we would also say, why did the Prophet not take revenge on people that did not accept Islam or called him a false prophet? Or the, the Quraysh that said, we don't accept you're a prophet. That's also freedom of speech. But what did we discover about the two girls anyway? They were forgiven. Yeah, yeah. Or, was or, it, or, or at least one we one. can say it's not established that what? Yeah, that they were killed. Yeah, that's yeah. the minimum we can say. It's not actually even established that they were killed. And all the narrations that talk about these things are conflicting and inauthentic. So that's a secondary point. But let me push you a little bit on the point because we had a conversation before the class about freedom of speech and stuff like that. Now freedom of speech has become, holy cow, really, has become one of the uh, gods of the West, uh, freedom of speech especially now the right wing we're seeing a lot of people speak about freedom of speech. How would you, uh, Abdul Rahman, if I were to say to you, listen, let's argue against freedom of speech right. as a concept. Yeah. Let's pretend now I am, because I think we're being a little bit defensive here. I think Ali's already itching. He wants to say, so what? He wants to start smacking. He wants to punch somebody. He'll say, yeah, bless me, Lewis. I'll take it and take me yeah, his opinion. Uh, and we're proud of it. I want to stone them and take the popcorn as well. Uh, <laughs> he, because he wants to say that. And, and certainly... There is an opinion in Islam which does talk about blasphemy laws. Obviously, Ibn Taymiyyah, the Sheikh has already mentioned, uh, talks about that very clearly. He says that someone who mocks and blasphemes the Prophet, whether they're Muslim or not, should be killed. And that's the opinion. There is another opinion, of course, as well. It's a lot which in is, Pakistan as well. Yeah, it's a big thing in Pakistan. But there is another opinion as well, which is the opinion of the Hanafis, who say that actually that's not the case. Mm. And that was the opinion that Ibn, Taym that Ibn Taymiyyah was arguing against, in fact. Because otherwise, if it was established, then there'd be... No reason for him to produce an entire book. Also, in yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is that there are two opinions, and both of them. So, if it was, if it was fully established that the opinion of blasphemy is X, Y, and Z, then there wouldn't be two opinions on the matter. What's the opinion of the Hanafis? The, the opinion of the Hanafis is that if a Christian or a Jew is to mock the Prophet Muhammad or to mock Islam, also not apostasy. Mock, uh, no mockery. I'm talking about okay. blasphemy laws that they would not be killed. Okay. And they, they have some interesting, you know, responses to that. Say, for example, someone came to the Prophet and said to him, he's the Mudhamman. He is the dispraiseworthy. He yeah. didn't, he didn't. For example, they use, this is a very famous thing that they use, mm. where the, the Jews came to the Prophet and said, As-Samu mm -hmm. that, you know, death be upon you, mm. which is considered to be mockery and an insult, to the point where Aisha attacked them very fiercely. But then the Prophet, you know, retorted. He said, you know, مَا كَانَ الْرِفْقُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا زَانَ وَمَا نُزَعَ الْرِفْقُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَانَهُ that the you know be that gentleness wasn't in something except that it made it more beautiful and the removal of gentleness from something made it more ugly so these are examples of when the Prophet was attacked you know face to face on on that on that level and he didn't respond in, he didn't respond in a manner that was belligerent or he didn't order even for the death of those people so there are two opinions in Islam let them hang it's not our business to tarjih and to say this one is the right one this one is the wrong one what we can say is 
uh, that when it comes to the opinion that says that you know it's, you, you can kill or you should kill, that whether one wants to take that opinion or not, the more important thing is about the psychological reactions of the Prophet Muhammad where, to criticism. Because what we don't see is that he's reacting in a way which is agitated. For example, I gave you the example of the, the Jewish tribes that came to him and said, Assalamu alaikum. I gave you the example of the person who said, Muthammam. There's another example, which is uh, when, when the woman was shouting and saying, you know, Muhammad is, I think it's the same, and he said, Muhammad is not, uh, this Muthammam is not here, it's not me. The way he dealt with it was a very classy way. He didn't get agitated like a narcissist, quote unquote, would, right? Because that's a, a, a broader psychological case that they try and make against the Prophet, that he was a man that was so obsessed with his character and so on, but we're not seeing that. So they bring these now, these examples that we've just given, and we've just seen 80% of them, if, if, if not more, have been at, uh, either attached to murder or committed a kind of murder or physical assault. So that's the first point. But before I get to Ali, I just want to ask Abd Rahman, how would you argue against the person now who's a free speech absolutist, who believes in it, holy, holy cow, this kind of thing? What would you say to them? Yeah, so I've had these conversations before with yeah. uh, people who claim to be absolutists in freedom of speech, and I don't believe there is such a thing. Um, and what I do is generally give them certain thought experiments. So um, let's say, for example, um, you know, nowadays we're seeing in the right wing space, yeah. we're seeing a lot of people, uh, even, even, quite frankly, we're seeing uh, these new age red pill people. Right. They're talking about, we're seeing on Twitter spaces and so on, they're talking about freedom of speech. Let's pretend me and you are having a conversation. So what would you say to them? I would say um, if something is done through consent and does not harm anyone, mm. do you feel like that should be allowed? Yes. Okay. So um, if someone were to use, for example, mid-journey AI. And what is that? Tell us what that is. Uh, mid-journey is a, a thing where you put a prompt in and you can create any image you want. Mm. If someone were to create a prompt whereby they would be showing child pornography, mm. but those children are not real children. They don't exist on this, on this earth, but they look exactly like, like children, like your daughter, like my daughter, for example. Mm. Would that be something that you would be fine with? Oh, so that's a fantastic one, isn't it? So it's a really good response. Because it's not harming anyone. Oh, that's, one. that's excellent. Because yeah. no one knows about it. And you don't need to do consent. So, because so what's the conclusion of this uh, excellent the argument? The conclusion is made? that no one believes in absolute freedom of speech. Uh -huh. Or freedom of anything that doesn't include And if they do believe it, then what will it cause? Uh, yeah, absurdities like this. No, just, I wouldn't call it absurdities. It would cause what? Uh, yeah, chaos. It would, it, would, it, would, it would cause negative consequences. Yeah, it would, exactly. No, no. That That's a very good, very good argument. Would you agree? Yeah. Excellent yeah. argument. Uh, it, it goes against human psychology to expect that. You know, to expect that you're mm. going to say something and there's going to be no consequences. Mm. Like, is that what's that movie when it goes to the black neighborhood? Oh, uh, Die Hard. Yeah, with the vengeance. Die Hard I mean, it's 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 crazy to expect that. Okay, you freedom. There's free, there's no freedom of consequence, brother. Mm. There's going to be consequence. There's no freedom of consequence. So. I had this conversation as well recently. That's a very good point. Freedom of speech, freedom of consequences. That's excellent. I like that uh, terminology as well. Because I had a conversation with, uh, with some of the guys and, and I was saying to them, look, what is freedom of speech? It's, if you put it on the political spectrum, where does it land? Mm -hmm. It lands more left, w if you think about it, it's closer to anarchy. Yeah. Because what you're saying is effectively, let's get the government out of the censorship of our speech. That's what you're saying. Isn't that what you're saying? So if you take it further, then I'll say, okay, let's get them out of protection. Let's get them out of what I say. You move towards an anarchical so position. The Salafis won't be happy with that. No, forget that for a second. What yeah. I'm saying is that if, if we're going in that direction as well, right, I would consider the position of those, let's just call them radicals for now, that we disagree with, the people that, you know, Charlie Hebdo and that we disagree with, I have to make sure that all the caveats are there. But it's more of an anarchical position. Think about it. Because what they're saying is this. You have freedom of speech. Yes? You have freedom of speech to say and mock whoever you like. But we also have freedom to go against the laws. And we don't care about the laws. We don't even believe in a social contract. Uh, contract. So if you think about freedom of speech, it's going in a trajectory whereby it's basically saying we don't want the government to get involved in these things. So what the <laughs> radical position is, let's say the terrorist position, the terrorist will say, well, I don't care if the government says it's illegal for me to kill a man. I'm going to do it anyway. So he's adopting a more freedom-centered approach. It's a more anarchical position. It's more radical than the free speech absolutist position. So if you push the envelope with the free speech absolute position, you become more like that anyway. So, he, so in that world where you can say whatever you want because you don't want the government to get involved and censor what you're saying, then the, 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 the respondent may say, well, I don't care. I don't want the government to get involved in the consequences I'm going to exact upon you if you try and hurt me with your words. 
which is, I'm going to hurt you with my body, which is the terrorist position, for the sake of argument. So what I'm saying is the terrorist position, it's not out of touch with a free speech anarchical position. In fact, it's a radical anarchical position. The terrorist position is in line with far left um, and that's why you'll find a lot of these groups they act like that, like Antifa and stuff like that. They probably understand it like that. So, you know, who cares about the government, whatever. We'll do what we want anyway. What I'm saying is, the blasphemy law, those who are, you know, if they want to take the terrorist position on the matter, in the Western context, then they have a, an argument to make as well, if they wanted to, which is similar to the argument that you would originally make, which is, let's get the government out of censoring our speech. They say, well, let's get the government out of censoring our actions. Which, even if it does harm, because I, for me, I don't care about harming or not harming, the terrorists would say. Uh, uh, do you want to add something? Yeah. Sheikh, um, when did Washi accept Islam? Washi? Yeah. I'm not sure exactly. Do you know if it was at the conquest of Mecca? Before yeah, 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 it was around this. After he killed uh, Hamza radiallahu anhu, and he returned, he accepted Islam, I think. I mean, I don't know exactly what, I haven't sure. come across exactly when he, I think it's around this time, to be honest. Yeah. 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 Mecca? Mm. Was it? Because it's, it's, it's quite profound because it can, it's a good argument to make where if it was personal, if there was anyone that could have been on that list, it would have been Wahshi. Yeah, beautiful. So, beautiful. And good if, point. It was, if it was personal, he would have said Wahshi is the Why? Why? For those who don't know be, why. Because the thing is, yeah, it mm. shows that it's not a matter of people violating his rights, uh -huh. rather Allah's rights. Because if it was Wahshi, he, he, we even know from narrations that he said, I don't, I don't, can you imagine? He said, I don't want to see him. Mm. That's how much he was hurt with what happened to his uncle Hamza. He killed his uncle, didn't he? Exactly. It? So, if he was alive at this time, this is profound because it shows it was never personal in the sense that it was that's Allah's, really, really Allah's good legislation that's been violated. Rashi is always an excellent argument. Exactly, but we need to find out if this if he accepted Islam because if he accepted Islam before, then it doesn't count because how is he going to put him in the name when he's a Muslim? So it all determ it determines when Rashi accepted Islam. If we find that out, then it's a powerful argument to use against them. Well, yeah, absolutely. He converted to Islam, and then he was. I think you can use the argument. When, I think it's very when? good. Because if he's after the before the conquest, then it's not going to apply, is it? Because why would he have him on the list on the nine when he accepted Islam before? Do you get it? No, when he wasn't. No, no, he, he accepted Islam in uh, Fatah Makkah. Okay, uh, uh, brilliant. So yeah. he, if they go, if we if we have the information, that is profound because it shows it's not personal. Yeah. Okay. So um, another just, thing which is highly sorry. Sorry, sorry can yeah. I just mention? Is this some uh, a similar situation to when? Um, Azat Ali was, was going to kill someone and raised his sword and the guy spat in his face. Yeah, I, I actually looked up that hadith. I think that was in, oh, is it weak? Is it, oh, I think no. the hadith is weak. Oh. Was it, is in, did they attribute yeah. to, to Khandaq? But no, no, but I might be wrong because I don't want to... Mm. <laughs> but I looked, I tried to find that hadith, but mm. I couldn't... I, but, I could be wrong. But he didn't kill him because it would have been yeah. something personal yeah. for him. Yeah, I need to double check if the authenticity of that hadith because yeah. someone yeah. mentioned it to me before. I tried to look it up and... But yeah, it yeah, would be the same thing. It would be the hadith is there, but I don't know if it's authentic or not. We've got a couple of slides, guys. Yeah, she uh, converted to Islam after the Fatih Makkah. Yeah. After. Yeah. After. Oh, yeah. After, yeah. Oh, there you go, go. No cap. Yeah. Yeah. There you have it. So okay, here we go. Next one. Uh, there's this very interesting thing. Uh, first of all, Bilal, obviously, uh, a black slave, who was uh, being tortured, and stuff. Now, he was symbolically given the right to go and give the Adhan from the top of the Kaaba. Now, that was such a powerful thing. I, I even came across some hadith that said some of the Arabs were very upset that a black man was doing that. But it's, this is one of the evidences that Islam is a religion that's colorblind. It's, it's only the only ancient world religion which really doesn't care about where you're from. And that's why it's been so successful in terms of bringing people from all kinds of, uh, corners of the earth. So it's a very beautiful thing. Another thing which to, before I end, you know this, I don't know if you come across this, this interaction with uh, Hind. You know Hind, uh, when she became Muslim and she was shouting and uh, and this whole story. I'm not sure if you came across the story. Or well, basically she was there and that she was asked to pledge allegiance with the woman. And then she, at the beginning she said, like, you didn't ask the men to do it like this. And she was shouting at the Prophet and she was, you know, all these kind of things. And she was saying, because, you know, in Surah Al-Bumtahana, it says that, you know, part of the uh, Pledge of Allegiance is that wala ya sirqana, wala ya znin, That you're not meant to steal or you're not meant to do zina. Wala ya qtulna, wala dahun, and that you don't kill your children and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then apparently she turned around and she was like, At So she was a very loud, uh, outspoken woman that, you know, she was doing all those kind of things. Uh, I came across the Hadith because this is a very blatant part of the uh, narrative. And in fact, I've seen some feminists 
make a point out of this and say, well, this shows you women had the right and the Prophet didn't engage her and he didn't, he let her speak and so on. And look, it shows you this and that. Actually, the hadiths are weak. <laughs> <laughs> no, the whole thing is weak. No, but it's important for me to, because someone will say, well, Sira, brother, the whole thing, you're going to keep saying this is weak and that is weak. I'm saying, but nowadays people are using these aspects from the Sira to justify feminism. Yeah. So at that point, I'm going to say to you, sorry to say, this thing is weak. Just like we did in the last session, we were talking about Amr al-Khattab apparently being shouted at by his wife. And he was standing there and his wife was telling him this and that and whatever. And then the man left because he said, I have, you've got a bigger problem than I do. And we said that hadith was weak. So if the moment I start seeing, we start seeing as a community, people start using this stuff to try and manipulate their husbands and, or to try and uh, deprecate from the role of the man or something like that. Or the opposite to try and create too much of a rigid environment for a woman or whatever it may be, then we have to say, sorry to say, your istidlal is da'if. Just because you're reading it or listening to it from a seerah, it doesn't mean it's correct. So the, if, the moment we start seeing people exploit the leniency that seerah writers have had with uh, narrations because it's not meant to be uh, highly authentic, then we should respond. Um, and this is the last thing I'm going to end with and very, very powerful. Uh, and it shows you, Allah, the idea of... We've spoken about this in the last couple of sessions. The idea of loyalty in Islam. Because what happened was that when the Prophet ﷺ came back to uh, Mecca, the Ansar started to see that his relationship with the people, he was very forgiving. And they felt something. They said, and they even started mentioning it. He said, like, you know, you're being very nice with them. And clearly mercy or compassion has overtook you because they felt it's like you could say they felt jealousy you could say they felt because look at this they love the prophet and this is good evidence they love the prophet muhammad so why are you like that with them it's like what about us we were there in the beginning so he came and he confronted them he says is it true that you guys are saying such and such to the ansar remember the ansar are the ones who, who were with him with all the ghazawat and all the fighting and all the this battle happened later on this hmm? happened actually after Ta'if. Really? Because I... After Hunayn and Ta'if. Because this is mentioned in the same chapter here, Sheikh. I don't know. strange, yeah. Because yeah. The, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when uh, mm. the bounty, he... Yeah, he was given it. And then yeah, so oh, they really? They found yeah, yeah. Uh, an issue with that. He's they, I found this, I picked this up from the book of uh, Ibrahim Al-Ali. Yeah, usually it's not mentioned after Fatih Mecca. Yeah. It's mentioned after mm. Ghazwat Hunayn. Really? The Battle of Hunayn and Ta'if. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'll mention, it, I'll mention it anyway. I'll mention it anyway. I mean, he mentions it in his book. In this chapter of Fatah Mecca, so that's the only reason. I'm... So, so basically, what happened was this: is that, you know, they came and so on, and they said, you know, you're being very nice with them. And, and then there was a phrase that he mentioned, which is a very powerful phrase, and it shows you the the the, the importance of loyalty in Islam. He says, "Falhayatu mahya, falhaya mahyakum wal mamat mamatukum." It's a very. He says basically, uh, this is a loose translation, but we live together and we die together. That's a very... Imagine the Prophet ﷺ saying that to you. He said, listen, we... They call it what? Ride or die. So we are together. We're one thing now. That's it. We live together and we die together. And that shows you the importance of the loyalty. That th There's such a connection between those people and it's the most beautiful thing that you can have. Maybe in the dunya, really. Having a, a true brotherhood. And this is something Islam uh, encourages. Loyalty uh, is something Islam is all about. With that, we conclude this session. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.